Hello, my name is Cliff Goodwin, and I want to welcome you here today for another edition of Preaching the Gospel. The honor and the privilege are mine to be your host. I have my Bible open before me, and I want to encourage you, as I always try to do, to take your Bible down as well and to open it up with me so that we might study the Word of God together. It needs to be emphasized, and perhaps from time to time, we need to be reminded that when it comes to all matters, religious and spiritual, no man living on earth today is the authority. Instead, the authority for all of our faith and practice is found in the Scriptures, the Word of God. And so it behooves us, therefore, as we spend time in study to make sure that we are actually spending time in Bible study. For it is the Word of God that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Now, that being said, I would like to invite you to open your Bible to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, we'll be beginning momentarily at verse 12, and we'll take our text for today's study out of this chapter. Colossians chapter 3, and we'll begin at verse 12. As you're finding that there in your own personal copy of the Bible, let me share with you our title for today's study. Today, we're going to be talking about embracing the Christian life. Embracing the Christian life. Now, typically, when we use the term embracing, it connotes to us a a couple of things. It connotes to us, first of all, a welcome or maybe an appreciation of something. You know, it bothers me that for far too many people, it would appear at least that their idea of Christianity is almost that of a grudge or something that they begrudge in their own hearts and in their own lives. We could go on to say, for example, that their Christianity is viewed negatively they they view it from the standpoint that it's a life about all the things I cannot do, all the things I cannot participate in. And if that's the case, then there are some deeply seated issues that that individual really needs to address. Remember that Jesus told us in John 10 and verse 10 that he came in order that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. The Christian life may truly be said to be the abundant life, the the best life that a person can possibly live. And yet, if we don't embrace it, if we don't have the proper attitudes toward it in a variety of areas, then we're not going to embrace the Christian life. And if we're not going to embrace the Christian life for what it really is, as found in Scripture, then really the problem arises. The problem becomes, am I a Christian? Am I truly living what I claim? Am I truly living what perhaps historically I've always identified with? But you know what? That life in in the Bible, it's not a life of begrudging our submission and our obedience to God. It's not a life of negativity. It's not a life of feeling like we're missing out on what the world has to offer. That's not what Christ intended. And so having said those things, as it were, to set the table, let's begin reading together in Colossians 3 and verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, Bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, love, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body. And be ye thankful. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Now, from these six or so verses, I would like for us to draw out three major ideas. And in these three ideas or concepts, I think we can see the basis for our embracing the Christian life, beginning afresh, perhaps, to appreciate it for the joy that it is, realizing maybe for the first time in a while the blessings that are ours in being able to be Christians and in being able to live as Christians. Three major ideas. So number one, they all begin with the letter A. The first one is the word accept. From verse 12, let us be reminded that we must accept God's judgment of us. Or let's make it personal. Accept God's judgment of you. Now, this really comes from the portion of verse 12 that we typically might read through rather quickly and perhaps even thoughtlessly. The beginning of verse 12, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Now, see, for the Christian, for the child of God, that is God's judgment of you or God's assessment, if you will of you. God peers down, as it were, from heaven, and when he looks upon his children, when he looks upon Christians, he sees those that he has chosen. He sees his children as the elect. Now think about that. What an honor, what a blessing beyond description that you and I would be the chosen of God. Not that he chose us arbitrarily. Now, I know that Calvinism alleges such, but that is not biblically based. He chose us in Christ. He chose us with reference to or in connection with our relationship in Christ. But nonetheless, He chose us. We are the elect of God. Now, secondly and thirdly, the elect of God are further described as being holy and Beloved, holy and beloved. We never need to lose sight of the fact that God has judged us and has made us to be holy in his Son. Now, how did that happen? Let's stay in the book of Colossians and back up two chapters with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, and notice beginning at verse 20 what we find. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. Now, notice this reconciliation has come up at least twice. We're reconciled by his blood in verse 20. We're reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, verses 21 and 22. By the way, what a great passage maybe to read on Sunday mornings when we observe the Lord's Supper. Did you catch that? The blood is mentioned in verse 20. The body of his flesh is mentioned here in verse 22. Both of these pertain to our reconciliation. The fact that we were estranged from God due to our sins, but now through the body and the blood of Jesus, we are reconciled to him. Now notice, because of that reconciliation in verse 22, to present you holy and unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. 
accept God's judgment of you if, in fact, you are his child. First of all, God looks down on you as his child, and God has judged you to be his elect. He's chosen you in Christ. Secondly, on the basis of the sacrifice of Christ, God judges you to be holy. You've been cleansed of your sins. You are now set apart, sanctified, made holy. And then thirdly, back referring to Colossians 3.12, you're beloved. You're beloved. Now, many of you in our viewing audience, your parents, whether mother or father, you, you have children of your own. As a parent, you know something about what it means to love your own child. You know something about what it means to have your child and, and the place that they occupy before you, both in your heart and in your mind, in your life. As human parents, we know a little bit about that. How much the more? How much the more that we have God as our Heavenly Father? And Paul told the Colossians, you are beloved. You are beloved in His eyes. Friends and brethren, if you're not embracing the Christian life, if you're not living it to its fullest, you're discontented, you feel perhaps dissatisfied or even unfulfilled, may I lovingly offer that these things are not God's fault. The problem does not lie with God. The problem does not lie with the Bible that you profess to follow. The problem likely lies in whether or not you have accepted God's judgment of you. You've got to accept that God has chosen you in Christ. You've got to accept that God has made you holy on the basis of the sacrifice of Christ. And you've got to accept and embrace the reality that God loves you as your heavenly Father, and He loves you as His child. Now, it is true, and we're about to get to this, it is true that with such esteemed position and privilege that there come responsibilities. That's absolutely true. But we, we might well begin by embracing this judgment that God has towards us. It, it's not a judgment of condemnation, not in Christ. He has judged us to be chosen, elect, holy, and beloved. Do you remember that? Do you realize that? Do you think that way? And do you live like that? And so number one, if we are embracing the Christian life, we have to accept God's judgment of us. We need to be thankful for it. We need to embrace the position and the status that he has given to us, freely given to us in his son, Jesus Christ. Now, point number two, we're still talking about embracing the Christian life. The second A word is the word act. Remember, I told you that with all of this privilege and all of these blessings come responsibility, and there, there's no getting around that. And really, if we love the Lord in return and we want to do what He requires of us, then we're not going to try to escape responsibility. We're, we're going to forge forward and we're going to, to, to be the men and women that God calls us to be. And so number two, act properly toward God's people. Act properly towards our brethren. Now, we see this as we go back to Colossians chapter 3 in our main text, verses 12 and following. Look at verse 12. We, we emphasized formerly the, the first portion of this in our first point. But now at the end of verse 12, this is what we are to put on. This is to be the spiritual garb or clothing, if you will, that we're to have on as people. Number one, bowels of mercies. We would say in modern English, we would say hearts of compassion. Number two, kindness. Number three, humbleness of mind. We might say humility or perhaps even lowliness. Number four, meekness. 
Number five, long-suffering. Then six and seven in the form of two participles, forbearance, forbearing one another, and forgiveness, forgiving one another. Isn't it interesting that in describing this Christian clothing, that if you take the participles along with the nouns, you have a a perfect seven in verses 12 and, and going into verse 13. You have the bowels of mercy, the compassion. You know, being a human being means that we're going to be frail. And it means that our fellow human beings are going to be frail. And there will be times when people hurt us. There will be times when people let us down. But there are also times when we will be the one hurting another. And there will inevitably be times when you, dear friend, you are going to let down someone who was counting on you. Now, this is true in human relationships in general. But now, when we get within the church, when we get within the body of Christ, the brotherhood, now this takes on a special meaning because we know that in the church, our Lord expects there to be unity. He knows that the church is described as a body in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where every member has care one for another. And and so in order to, quote, grease the wheels of, of this family of God, it's going to take all of these things, the compassion or the hearts of of compassion, the kindness, the, the doing good to one another in a way that is serviceable. It it helps meet needs, and and it shows love and compassion. The humbleness of mind, there's no way, there's no way that we can act properly toward God's people if we're puffed up in ourselves. If, If we really are looking down our noses at our brothers and sisters as if we're superior, there's no way that we'll act properly toward them. The meekness, this is humility that takes on a, an added feature. Meekness is not humility, but it's closely related thereunto. Meekness has been described as the willingness to suffer wrong instead of inflicting wrong yourself. And that's a special quality. It's a Christian quality. wherein. A person realizes that in order to follow Christ and to follow his example and to serve him as Lord, I might well be wronged by others, but in my meekness and in my humility, I choose not to retaliate. I choose not to wrong someone in return. What a marvelous quality. What an admirable quality. And then long-suffering, in the Greek text, of course, literally long-tempered. Now, you don't need me to, to sit here and to point out the specific ways in which hearts of compassion, kindness, humility, long-suffering, and meekness, you don't need me to point out specifically how that's going to improve our relationships in the church. That goes without saying. Uh, we see it in the world, whether it's in the workplace or or even in our homes, we, we see this to be true, and it's equally applicable within the church. But here in this context, remember that we're, we've put on these qualities as the elect of God, as individuals whom God has made holy and whom God views as beloved. And so because of God's judgment of us, because of what God has done to us and for us and how God deems us, we then have the responsibilities of acting properly toward one another. Now, before we leave this point, it's interesting to point out something about those two participles. Did you notice them there in verse 13? These are action words, whereas the previous five items had been Uh, character traits or descriptions. But in these two participles, we now have action words, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. 
It might well be said that if you take the attitudes that are mentioned in verse 12 and you put them into action, then you'll see what we have in verse 13. First of all, forbearing one another. Some have described this as putting up with one another. (laughs) I know that's not very favorable as we think about it, but in human relationships, sometimes it's as simple as loving one another enough to put up with one another. In the difficult times when a brother or a sister is not at his or her best, they're not having the best day, and instead of of pouncing on that and escalating the problem and making it worse, we forbear. We're willing to love and to have pity and compassion, and we put up with that. And then if it ever does cross the line from, from petty grievances into sin, wherein a brother or sister wrongs us, then the other participle comes into play. We forgive. We forbear. But as needed, too, we forgive. And we do that because Christ forgave us. Embracing the Christian life. The Christian life's the greatest life that we can live. But we've got to accept the position that God has put us in. It's a highly exalted position. We need to ever be aware of that and thankful for that. We need to act properly toward our brothers and sisters in the church But now that brings us to a third and to a final point. And this is the word allow. We have to allow the peace of God to rule our lives. Now, I'll tell you, this one also is not always easy. Notice this comes up in verses 15 through 17 here in our text, Colossians 3. Verse 15 says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. May I submit to you that perhaps, perhaps the key to allowing the peace of God to rule our hearts and rule our lives, maybe the key is found at the end of verse 15. Be Ye thankful. Ingratitude has to be one of the worst sins, and yet it it gets little fanfare. (laughs) So little is, is said about ingratitude, but it has to be one of the worst sins. And I say that because ingratitude is when a person enjoys every good and every perfect gift from God, James 1, 17, and, and that's what we enjoy. Every good thing in our lives is a gift from God. He enjoys, as a Christian, he enjoys all spiritual blessings in Christ, Ephesians 1, 3. We enjoy all of God's goodness only to forget, only not to realize and not to remember the importance of God's love and God's provision in our lives. And so we forget, we neglect, we lose sight of what's going on, and and we soon lose sight of the giver. If we are not thankful for the gifts, we soon lose sight of the giver. So let's talk in this third place about allowing the peace of God to rule in our lives. One writer, if I remember correctly, I think it was something I was reading. One writer provided this description about the peace of God ruling our lives. He he described it as the idea, the realization that all is well in life. Come what may, all is well in my life simply because I'm right with God. Think about that. (laughs) You know, if in fact, dear friend, you are a child of God, a New Testament Christian, you've obeyed the gospel, you're, you're faithful before him, your life is right with God. And that really means in the final analysis that come what may, all is well in life. Now, it's not saying that you might not have problems at work. It's not saying that you might not have problems 
at home. It's not saying that you might not have health problems. But what it is saying is don't lose sight of the big picture. Come what may in life, everything is going to be all right because you're right with God. Now, when you realize that, the peace of God can rule your life and it can rule your heart. How important that is. Let's stay in the book of Colossians and let's back up momentarily to chapter one once again. But this time, notice with me verses 3 and following. Colossians 1, verse 3. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints. Now, in the old King James, verse 5, it continues for. But the idea really is because. So the faith that you have in Christ Jesus, the love that you have to all the saints is because of the hope, verse 5, which is laid up for you in heaven. Now, again, getting back to that statement, all is well in life, come what may, because I'm right with God. See, being right with God entails having the hope of heaven. Friend, we've got to remember that we're going to heaven. Heaven has always got to stay at the forefront of our minds and of our lives. We're going to heaven. God loves me. God has saved me. God is taking me to heaven. Now, that that ties in with both ideas that we found back in chapter 3. The idea of peace, but also the idea of gratitude. And so if I'm going to embrace the Christian life, if I'm going to live it for all of its all its worth, if I'm going to revel, as it were, in the joy that is mine as a child of God, I've got to allow the peace of God to rule my heart. I've got to remember that I'm going to heaven no matter what as I as I live faithfully before him. And I've got to ever, forever be thankful that God has made this possible. Thank you so much for being with me today for preaching the gospel. I hope that if it is the case that you're struggling with embracing the Christian life and enjoying it and living it to its fullness, I hope that you'll find an older, perhaps seasoned, faithful child of God and confide in that person. Talk with him or her and share with them the the struggles that you've had maybe maintaining the proper attitude toward the blessings of God, and seek the help that can come from faithful Christians. Now, all of that help, we know and understand, is grounded in the Word of God. And so, most importantly, turn back to the Scriptures, get back in the Word of God, spend time in the Word, and thank God anew. Thank God afresh for all that he has done for you and for me and for everybody through his son, Jesus Christ.